Guess what day it is? Oh, oh. It's French Friday, it's French Friday, so grab your fries and say hooray! David French is here to play on French Friday! It's French Friday! David French, what's new? Uh, too many things, Guy, too many things, but... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, all, some of them good, some of them, some of them, uh, some of them not great. I was uh, overseas in Europe during Thanksgiving, and I caught little bits and pieces of what you had incoming and all the controversy. So we're going to unpack that today. Yeah, let's let's do it. I haven't talked about it nearly enough. I, I feel like I, I'm sure. I feel like I need like a press shop to respond to all the incoming fire because, like, I'm just I'm just one dude, you know, and when there's five or six think pieces all telling me, you know, like how bad I am and how I'm a symbol of the loss of the virility of American evangelicalism, then, then, you know, I, I need help, Sky. I, I, I need assistance. Well, we're here to assist. <laughs> okay. Uh, but first of all, before we get into the details of the story, which are myriad, I'm just curious, did you anticipate this kind of response when you wrote your piece? I did not anticipate this intensity. Um, okay. I, I did not expect to, I, I expected a response. I did not expect it. Um, and I, I expected a lot of some Twitter anger. Um, I did not expect six days, seven days, eight days. I think more pieces were published as we record this, you know, early in the week. Um, I did not expect that multi, this sort of multi-day explosion and it kind of sort of reminded me of the uh anti-david fringism explosion in in the summer of 2019 and there's some sim similarities between those two things right yeah 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 there's definitely definitely a pile on happening so let's get to the bottom of the pile to the actual football <laughs> right. here um this all started over the respect for marriage act describe what that is yeah so the respect for marriage act is a is a law written to a, a deal with the possibility that the Supreme Court might overrule Obergefell. Obergefell is the case that constitutionalized, established there was a constitutional right to same-sex marriage. And people are concerned about this because uh, the Dobbs decision, the Dobbs, the, the decision that overturned Roe v. Wade, had a concurrence by Justice Clarence Thomas where he said, that all of the cases decided on, on the basis of substantive due process, which is a, a legal doctrine the Supreme Court formulated for, to recognize unenumerated rights, and this is something we've talked about before in, on French Fridays, that all of the cases involving substantive due process should be reconsidered. Now, this doesn't mean overturned. Justice Thomas has long had this view that uh, unenumerated rights have been analyzed under the wrong provision of the 14th Amendment. So this is super wonky and nerdy. Okay. He, <laughs> yeah, this is an advisory opinion kind oh, of stuff. Oh, yeah, this is, but it's important context. So he believes they should be in, evaluated under the privileges or immunities clause. So he wasn't saying that all of these precedents like Griswold, or which established a right to contraception, or Loving v. Virginia, which established a right to interracial marriage, or even a, or a, Berger, a Bergefell, which established, you know, the right to same-sex marriage, that they all should be done away with he was saying reevaluate now and and perhaps come to a constitutional right for these things but based on a different premise is that correct the or not <laughs> or, or not. not right so now at the same time the majority opinion in dobbs uh said that you should not take this opinion as undermining obergefell or a bunch of others the the, the substantive due process opinions why because Dobbs, unlike Obergefell and Loving and Griswold and all of these others, involves another person, the unborn baby, right, that is the victim of abortion. And so um, lots of people then immediately started fighting after Dobbs was decided over whether Obergefell was going to fall. That's the genesis of the Respect for Marriage Act. And so the Respect for Marriage Act was a, um, an, a congressional attempt to protect same-sex marriages in the event that Obergefell is overruled, and Republicans agreed to go along with it, or a dozen Republicans in the Senate agreed to go along with it, only so long as it included protections for religious liberty in the bill as well. 
So the bill is supposed to do two things at once. It is supposed to say, if you are legally married in one state or to one jurisdiction, another state or another jurisdiction has to give full faith and credit to your marriage without regard to race, sex, um, sexual orientation. And the other thing that it does is it's trying to say, and oh, by the way, in recognizing that marriage, we do not mean to undermine religious liberty in any way, and we do not mean to undermine your ability to access a whole host of sort of government benefits, including tax exemptions, accreditation, grants, contracts, et cetera. And so that's the compromise of the, of the um, you know, the Respect for Marriage Act right there. So just from a, a conservative political point of view, one of the criticisms I've heard for many, many years of the Supreme Court is that conservatives argue that the courts are finding rights that they don't think necessarily right. exist in the Constitution, and the better route is to legislate these things, right. to pass laws, mm -hmm. to make something legal. That's what's happening here. It's not that the courts have overturned a Obergefell and made same-sex marriage illegal, but in anticipation of that possibility, the legislature, the Congress is stepping in and saying, let's pass a law to just guarantee that this is maintained. Right. Which on a conservative point of view sounds like a win. Um, before we unpack your point of view on right. this and some of the responses to your point of view, <laughs> let's back up a little bit and first articulate your theological belief about marriage. Yes. So that's really easy to state. Um, I, and, and you can, I'm a, I'm a signatory to a very controversial statement um, called the Nashville Statement. So for those who don't know what the Nashville Statement is, the Nashville Statement was a statement of Christian orthodoxy regarding, uh, or, you know, the, a, a, no, I'm not going to say the statement of Christian orthodoxy. I'm going to say a statement of Christian orthodoxy around marriage, sex, sexuality, gender identity. And the Nashville Statement, Article 1, the very first statement of it is, we affirm that God has designed marriage to be a covenantal, sexual, procreative, lifelong union of one man and one woman as husband and wife, and is meant to signify the covenant love between Christ and his bride, the church. I signed that. That's where I am. That's my theological position on marriage. In other words, the, the historic Orthodox Christian teaching. Correct on marriage. Yes. And that has not changed. New. <laughs> okay. At no point so, in so my I... life has that changed. <clears throat> right. Okay. And 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 I uh I also share that historic understanding theological definition of Christian marriage. Now, uh your view about marriage legally has changed. Yes. Okay. And and it's changed more than once. Yes. So walk us through where you were. I think the date you you listed in one of the pieces you wrote was prior to 2004, uh -huh. and then after 2004, and then was it 2015 or 14 that a book, a Burger 2015, Bell was, yeah. 2015, that was decided, and today. So kind of take us through that journey, knowing that your theological position has been the same this whole time. Yes. How has your, your civic, civil, legal understanding of marriage changed? Yes, okay, so my view of so let, let's, let's define our terms. The Nashville Statement version of marriage, I'll call that Christian marriage or covenant marriage. It's, in other words, it's a, it's a religious definition of marriage. Since, you know, the 1960s, 1970s, that has not been civil marriage in the U.S. So civil right. marriage and covenant marriage are two different things. And, and it's very important for people to understand this. Civil marriage in the United States is not covenant marriage. It is a breakable at will relationship. It is not even as strong as a contract. Okay. So I, I would find it easier as a matter of law to end a marriage than to break a refrigerator warranty. Okay. That is, and I, I'm not making that up. You, a refrigerator warranty sky is an unbreakable document basically, but. But what, what you're referring to is the idea of no fault correct. divorce. So no okay. fault divorce so, is not a Christian concept. All right. And define that for those who are unfamiliar with what that legally means. So no-fault divorce, and every state in the union either has a no-fault divorce regime or something very similar to that. And what that means is, if I ask for a divorce, I can merely cite, for example, depending on the language of the law, irreconcilable differences. And I'm going to be entitled 
to the divorce. In other words, if my wife doesn't want to divorce me and she does not believe there are grounds for divorce, it doesn't matter. I can end the relationship. You can end the relationship essentially and functionally as a matter of right without having to show that she did anything wrong at all, that she didn't. And right. And these, these no fault divorce laws began in the 1960s. Was California, I think, the first state to sign that into law? I would say don't quote me on that, but yes, but you're going to, but I'm saying it out loud. So you, I'm quoting myself on that, but I believe that's right. Um, Okay. Yeah. More importantly, these, I, these laws spread throughout the United yep. States beginning in the 1960s. Prior to that, my understanding, you're the lawyer mm -hmm. here, but my understanding was states took an interest in the preservation of a marriage Correct. and you had to show some limited grounds for the divorce. Yes. And if you couldn't do that, the state would say, we will not grant you a divorce because it is in the interest of society, of the state, of the family to maintain these marriages. Correct. As a matter of law, previously you had to show a ground. You had to go show reasons, not just irreconcilable differences. In other words, I want out. <laughs> it was right. abuse, abandonment, adultery. And statutes varied state by state, but you had to demonstrate grounds. And so now in practice, in practice, you, you shouldn't look at the change from the fault-based regime to the no-fault regime as a, as a sudden change. The reality is the fault-based regimes over time were already evolving. It was, it, as a matter of practice and reality, you could assert the grounds and courts were pretty liberal in granting in a, a, a divorce. So there was a more of an evolution and then no-fault divorce was sort of the exclamation point at the end of the sentence um, that said, this is yeah. a big change. But the point is a no fault divorce civil regime is quite inconsistent with covenantal marriage in the Christian understanding. Correct. They are like ships okay. passing in the night. Yes. Okay. So uh, back to your evolution on this question. Yes. What was your, where were you prior to 2004? on your understanding of civil marriage. Yeah, so in 2004, right, that's right after, I think it was September, October, November of 03 is when the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court decided that the Massachusetts Constitution protected same-sex marriage. And that might've been the first state to recognize same-sex marriage. And there was a big uproar. And I'd always been very down on no-fault divorce as really an institution of uh, uh, marriage defined through the uh, and civil marriage defined through the no fault divorce regime as sort of an institution of unique vitality <laughs> in American life. And so when I saw that decision, I didn't see it as really anything more than an incremental logical extension of the civil marriage regime that already existed. So the civil marriage regime that already existed was really centered around adult happiness, adult autonomy, okay? And so saying that, well, heterosexuals are going to enjoy this breakable at will relationship that the state is going to call marriage um, that is centered around fundamentally around their own autonomy and happiness and will and saying that is something that is vitally important to civilizational preservation, but you extend that to a relatively small number of same-sex couples, relative, of course, to the big, big number of straight couples, that that's somehow a, a devolution of marriage. I just, I didn't buy it. And I could see the point of gay couples who said, wait a minute, this isn't, I'm not, I'm not asking for the Catholic church to change its definition of marriage. I'm not asking for Baptist churches to change the definition of marriage. What I'm asking is to be included in this sort of quasi-contractual civil marriage relationship that the state has created. And in my view, I did, not ha I did not have an objection to that. I did not have an objection. So if I'm hearing you correctly, same-sex marriage is a significant departure from covenantal Christian theological understanding of marriage. Correct. But it's really not a massive departure from what had existed prior in the civil marriage definition. Correct. Correct. 
Correct. That was that okay. was my view and my view. That was my view then and my view my view now. Okay. In between, you change that to a degree. Yes. Explain the evolution again of your thinking on this. Yes. In the in the years between two thousand four and twenty twenty two. Yes. So what happened? So remember, I I have this extreme. Uh, I have an extreme. Uh, well, maybe extreme is the wrong word, but a a. a uh, I am devoted to the idea of covenant marriage as that is what marriage actually is. Okay, that in my view, in the eyes of God, that is what marriage actually is. And what I began to see happen in the years after the Massachusetts Supreme Court decision was a series of what I would say then and now is an, a large amount of overreach where advocates for same-sex marriage began to question whether or not the institutions that protect and advance covenant marriage or Christian marriage could exist as equal members of American society if American society recognized same-sex marriage. So this is where you saw, for example, and I saw this in my religious liberty work, that religious organizations couldn't exist on campus if they recognized marriage between a, a covenant marriage, or that Individuals couldn't receive jobs or promotions if they recognized covenant marriage, or the tax exemption for religious institutions couldn't exist with if they recognized covenant marriage. And so what you began to see was almost this situation arising where it was, if we're going to recognize same-sex marriage, then those of us who believe in covenant marriage or Christian marriage by our American society are going to be treated as virtual white supremacists or bigots or in all of the institutions that we have built and we've created that advance and inculcate this, this profound moral value that we believe are going to be under siege. And my position was then, okay, wait a minute. If that means, if you're saying to me that same-sex marriage Recognition of same-sex marriage means that your understanding of covenant marriage is going to be excluded in many ways as a matter of law from American society. Well, then I'm going to say no to that legal reform, and I'm going to say, how can we give benefits that are sort of equivalent to marriage, say civil unions, et cetera, et cetera, that it would be equivalent, equivalent to what you get from civil marriage while retaining um, the ability to advance what covenant or Christian marriage is. And that's when I, so, I, I said, no, 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 hold on, hold the phone here. There's a, a direct attack on covenant marriage taking place. So it sounds a little bit like <clears throat> uh, certain advocates of gay marriage, uh, more progressive activists were pushing the thing so far that it was becoming a threat to religious liberty and not just to conservative Christians, no. but to religious believers of all variety, Muslims, Hindus, Jews, others who hold to a, more or less a covenant understanding of marriage, although not all on the same theological grounds. So is, is that fair to say that when you saw it more as a threat to religious liberty, you began to question whether or not you could support the, same, the legalization of same-sex marriage broadly? I would say it was, it was a lot more than just sort of religious liberty, because that's a phrase that we use to describe a threat to religious liberty is even slight encroachments <laughs> on religious autonomy. No, I'm talking about what we're talking about when we said threat to religious liberty. We're talking about profound uh, issues. So I'll, I'll read to you an exchange from the Obergefell oral argument. This is between. Oh, this is, yeah, I'm familiar with yeah. this, but it's important for people to hear. Right. It. So this was Justice Samuel Alito asked the Solicitor General, uh, uh, General Verrilli, who was the Obama Solicitor General, Donald B. Verrilli Jr. In Obergefell oral argument, he says, well, in the Bob Jones case, this was a case where the court allowed the stripping of tax exemptions from Bob Jones University because of its racially discriminatory policies. Well, in the Bob Jones case, the court held that a college was not entitled to tax-exempt status if it opposed interracial marriage or interracial dating. So would the same apply to a university or a college if it opposed same-sex marriage? And here comes Solicitor General Verrilli. You know? I don't think I can answer that question without knowing more specifics, but it's certainly going to be an issue. I don't deny that. I don't deny that, Justice Alito. It is going to be an issue. Now, that is a giant own goal by solicitor, the Solicitor General of the United States. 
Because the correct answer there is no, Justice Alito. We do not equate people who uphold traditional orthodox views of marriage with white supremacists. Okay? <laughs> we do well, not do we that. We don't, but there are, there are a, there's a small minority of people that may. But as the Solicitor General of the United States of America, speaking on behalf of the administration and advancing the position of the United States of America, we do not. We do not. And so that was... That's serious business there, right? That's very serious business. And so all of a sudden, you're not sitting here thinking, okay, wait, only civil marriage is at issue. You're thinking, wait a minute, the recognition of same-sex marriage could be a sledgehammer that is used to break apart the churches, the religious schools, the religious institutions, that do not conform. So when we say threat to religious liberty, we're meaning treating them as if they're white supremacists. That's, that's what you're talking about. Right. It's, it, it, it would be taking the University of Notre Dame and treating it like Bob Jones University. In ni- yeah, right. Or, right. Treating it like yeah. it's the, you know, a white identity church or something like that. Right. Okay. So up to the present. You wrote a piece a uh, week ago, a mm-hmm. little over a week ago, yes, um, in The Atlantic, talking about how you now have changed your view again uh, in light of the fact that Obergefell was ruled in 2015, there is some concern that it could be overruled because of what happened with Dobbs, and that there are, I don't know how many, thousands of people, millions perhaps, in same-sex marriages, right. legally recognized same-sex marriages. That was not the case before 2015, at least not through most of the country. Um, briefly explain what your argument was in your newest piece that ignited the firestorm, the pile on, <laughs> whatever metaphor we're going to use here. Yeah. So remember, here's, here's what I'm thinking. Protect covenant marriage and my ability to, um, you know, my ability to enter into a covenant marriage, to advocate for covenant marriage, to build institutions that support covenant marriage, to maintain churches and church organizations that support covenant marriage, and at the same time, my view that civil marriage was something else, okay? That civil marriage was not covenant marriage, and I did not, in principle, have an objection to the inclusion of gay couples in this civil marriage. So here's what happened since 2015, okay? In 2015, Obergefell is decided, and Justice Kennedy writes this. Finally, it must be emphasized that religions and those who adhere to religious doctrines may continue to advocate with utmost sincere conviction that by divine precepts, same-sex marriage should not be condoned. The First Amendment ensures that religious organizations and persons are given proper protection as they seek to teach the principles that are so fulfilling and so central to their lives and faiths. So, as I read those, Amen. As I read those words, I thought, those are really good words. We'll see if they survive yeah. the test of time. And in fact, they have. And so since 2015, religious liberty in the United States has only become stronger. Uh, there has been just an unbelievable winning streak for religious liberty in the United States, including... Well, hold on. Hold on. Yes. Before you go on there, to qualify that a little bit, because I know what people are going to object to, uh, legally, religious liberty has had a winning streak in the United States, but people often are reacting to what they see culturally where they would perceive an increased marginalization of people who hold to traditional views of marriage. Even though legally it's stronger than ever, culturally it feels weaker and less central than ever. Right. Is that fair? I I would say it is fair, but I would say that, again, if I'm talking about what is my view of of marriage as covenant marriage, Um, What I would say is that culturally marriage has been under siege for a very long time. (laughs) So, you know, and both in churches and outside of churches, this whole notion of of marriage is a lifelong union of uh, of a man and woman, unbreakable except in certain uh, very narrow categories as defined in scripture. That has been something that has been under siege for a very long time. And It is our responsibility as believers to be standard bearers culturally 
for our position, okay? And to not just with words, words are cheap, okay? With actions and the way in which we live out our lives, the way in which we live out our marriages, for example. So I think the cultural sphere and the legal sphere, we have to separate them out a bit. Um, the legal sphere, it's, the message has been very clear. Even when, even when there's been a conflict between same-sex marriage and religious liberty, directly, like head on, religious liberty is won. So for example, in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, where a Christian baker faced state sanction for refusing to design a custom cake for a same-sex wedding, he won that case seven to two because the state had specifically targeted his religious faith. In a case called Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, where the City of Philadelphia refused to contract with Catholic Social Services because uh, CSS would not certify same-sex couples as foster parents, um, Catholic Social Services won nine to zero. I mean, you even got Sonia Sotomayor, Justice Sotomayor, in that nine, right? So time and time again, religious freedom has prevailed. Doesn't mean that there aren't challenges. I mean, Jack Phillips should never have faced the persecution that he faced. The city of Philadelphia never should have taken the actions against Catholic social services, but they won. They won. And there's a case before the Supreme Court right now called 303 Creative involving a web designer who doesn't design websites for causes or ideas that she doesn't agree with. And that case is, again, highly likely to, to turn out in the website designer's favor. So the thing that you, be, you really feared in 2015, where the deciding of Obergefell would be the end of religious liberty, really didn't happen. It was the dog that didn't bark. Now, the other thing that happened is, uh, I haven't seen the latest numbers, but you know, somewhere around half a million same-sex marriage licenses have been issued. So that would mean a million people in a same-sex marriage with children, a lot of children attached as well. So you have families, people who've built their lives around the existence of this legal right. And when you're talking about whether or not to overturn precedent in the United States of America, one of the very, very, very important principles you apply or questions you ask is to what extent have people understandably relied upon the existence of this legal regime in the conduct of their lives? So if you have a million plus people who have relied about as much as you can rely as a human being on a legal doctrine, there is a very, very high burden to rip out that legal superstructure. And in fact, I would say, and this is what got people really mad at me, I think it would be unjust to rip out that legal superstructure upon which people have built their lives. And so that's where we are, are as of, you know, the, the negotiation of the Respect for Marriage Act, which was, look, the threat we thought that was going to, um, that Obergefell would end up demolishing religious liberty has not panned out. In fact, religious liberty is much stronger than it was even in 2015. And a million plus Americans, fellow citizens, have built their lives around the existence of this particular legal right. So now what? Now what do you do when a Supreme Court justice has indicated that the court might reconsider this doctrine? Let's talk about the criticisms. And there's plenty. Oh, yeah. There's plenty. There's Al Mohler wrote one that has probably gotten the most press. Um, and then there's all the, the minions on Twitter that are going nuts. And, and people are attacking you for different reasons. Sure. And we, we, we are not going to cover all of them because some of them are just so ridiculous they're not worth covering. But let's, let's cover at least two, maybe more, but two that I saw most frequently. Mm -hmm. And the first one you've already started talking about, but there are those who are saying that this bill is bad because it doesn't offer enough religious liberty protections. Um, Moeller, for example, cites Senator Mike Lee from Utah, Republican, who in a tweet said, I offered to support the bill if the sponsors would include my amendment to prohibit the government from removing tax-exempt status based on religious beliefs about same-sex marriage or against it. The sponsors adamantly refused even to consider that. Why? So Mike Lee and Al Mohler quoting Mike Lee is saying, this bill is setting up the exact scenario that you were worried about back in 2015, that it is going to erode religious liberty 
Uh, he also cites the president of ADF, the Alliance for Defending Freedom, who used to work for them, who also is not supporting this bill because apparently, I don't I haven't looked at it myself, but based on what Mueller is saying, it doesn't offer enough religious liberty protections. Um, the, the, make the best case you can for what limits the religious freedom they might be reacting to. What is not robust enough here? In other mm -hmm. words, give me the best non-straw argument you can from your opponents as to what it is that this bill lacks yeah. that could make it stronger for religious liberty. Uh, there's a couple of things. One is, remember I mentioned Jack Phillips and Masterpiece Cake Shop. Uh, I also mentioned right. Fulton and City of Philadelphia. This bill would not provide protections for Jack Phillips or Catholic Social Services or 303 Creative, this other case I brought up, because the, the state action they faced was not federal action. It was state from the, or city. So it's the state of Colorado that has caused so many problems for Jack Phillips. It's the city of Philadelphia that caused so many problems for Catholic Social Services. And so this bill doesn't do anything to protect an individual from a state or a local government, okay? Um, and that is, so if somebody says, does this bill protect Jack Phillips? The answer is no, because it only is applicable to the federal government when it comes to its, its, its religious liberty protections. Now, the really interesting question about this guy, and, and we can, man, we can go about as nerdy or wonky as you want to go, is there's actually Supreme Court authority that says there are limits on the extent to which Congress can protect people from state actions um, that infringe upon religious liberty. Um, and so con Congress doesn't necessarily have the power to pass a law that protects American citizens from all of the ways in which states or local governments could theoretically infringe on religious liberty. But this, this bill doesn't even try, okay? It doesn't even try. So that, that's number one. But to, to your earlier comment, there are a number of cases that are before the Supreme right. Court right now, which if they are ruled the way that most people anticipate, including liberals think it will go, yeah. those things may be moot in a few months right. when, when the state laws are changed because of the Supreme Court rather than Congress. Right. Your, your quote unquote fallback in this situation is the very, is the first amendment of the United States. Right. So the first amendment unquestionably reaches to state and local government action. And so when I say the religious freedom has prevailed, I'm talking about the first amendment has prevailed. And so the first amendment is stronger than any act of Congress because Congress can of course repeal its own acts, right? So, um, so th to say that this act does not protect a Jack Phillips or a Catholic Social Services or 303 Creative does not mean they're unprotected. They're protected by the right. First Amendment. But this bill does not even try to go beyond the federal government. So that is criticism number one. And, and if, look, if I had my druthers, if, if I could write this bill and I knew I could get Democratic sign off. I, I'd try, I'd try to protect a, a Jack Phillips. Um, and, and I'd have to like look hard and how to do that and consistent with pr prior Supreme Court precedent. But I'd try. Um, but there's not Democratic sign off on that. Number two criticism is that or revolves around sort of this issue of tax exemptions and government benefits. So what this bill says is. You can't use this bill as a basis for revoking tax exemptions, access to grants, et cetera. In other words, this bill is not a weapon to be wielded against, on the, um, against private institutions on the basis of religious. Uh, 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 this bill can't be wielded as a weapon to take away the tax exemption. That is not the same thing as saying the tax exemption cannot be revoked, if that makes sense. So in other words, okay, it could be revoked on other grounds, just not this law. Not this law. Now, the bill in many ways also has some language though that that says it would be it would be really hard. It would be really hard um, to actually revoke the tax exemption after this bill because um, 
when this bill says that it cannot be used to revoke the tax exemption, in other words, the recognition of same-sex marriage mandated in this bill cannot be used to revoke the tax exemption, and when the bill also um, indicates that it indicates appreciation and respect for dissenting views on, on marriage, it makes it extremely difficult extremely difficult to revoke the tax exemption. The bill actually say, says that diverse beliefs about the role of gender in marriage are held by, quote, reasonable and sincere people based on decent and honorable philosophical premises. Now, which sounds like an echo of what Kennedy wrote in his decision around a burger. Exactly. It's an echo. So you have to feel, think through how does the IRS revoke a tax exemption? Okay. For the IRS to revoke a tax exemption, as we learned from Bob Jones, it has to say that this organization does not exist for a charitable purpose. In other words, there's something about this organization that is so toxic that it cannot be considered to really have a charitable purpose. Well, with Bob Jones, it, was, it had explicitly racially discriminatory policies. And that is so toxic that organizations with explicitly racially discriminatory policies can't receive the tax exemption. Now, in this circumstance, the thing, same-sex marriage, that people are afraid would create a reification of the tax exemption, Congress has said in black and white that reasonable and sincere people based on decent and honorable philosophical premises hold contrary views. Congress has said in black and white the act that they, the very act they use to protect religious liberty can't be used, I mean, protect same-sex marriage can't be used to revoke a tax exemption. And the Supreme Court has said in the majority opinion in Obergefell that the First Amendment, uh, talking about the goodwill. So right now, the tax exemption, guys, is safe. It is safe. When, when two of the three branches of government have explicitly stated that holding to a traditional view of marriage is not malice or right. in any way evil, in fact, may be held for very uh, admirable and uh, beneficial reasons, it'd be pretty hard for the executive branch through the IRS to suddenly revoke tax exemptions. Exactly. Status. Now, that's not to say that at some point in the future, Congress could m enact a different law or some point in the future, the IRS might give it a try. When I say it's safe, I don't mean it's safe from an attempt. I'm saying that it's safe from the outcome of the revocation of the tax exemption. And, you know, look, and I'm not going to predict the world 25 years from now, Scott. Um, right. I had trouble on the night before the election on November of 2016 predicting a day, a day later. So I'm not, I'm not going to predict but, 25 years from now. But what you're saying is this bill, as, it, as it's currently written, is not the threat that some people are making it out to. No. Be. And in fact, the bill actually makes tax exemptions safer than existed before. Let's, let's turn now to the other criticism that I have bumped into the most, including from Al Mohler and, again, all the, the Twitter minions that are out there. And this is the one I find actually more interesting mm -hmm. and more compelling. Uh, not that I agree with them, but it's, it's the cultural argument. Mm -hmm. The idea that David French is capitulating to the pluralism of our culture by abandoning the Christian doctrine of marriage. And your belief that we should live in a pluralistic society with people who have different views of marriage is in itself a direct threat to civilization. And uh, by allowing this law to continue, the same-sex marriage law in the United States, somehow you are then responsible for the erosion of civilization itself, and certainly conservatism. Yeah. That was Moeller's argument, yeah. that conservatism cannot last if traditional Christian marriage is not preserved. You've responded already in a number of places to this, arguing, as you said earlier in this, in this conversation, that, hey, the, the covenantal view of marriage was abandoned a long time ago yeah. in the United States. It didn't happen in 2015. Um, but what do you make of those people who are saying, we as Christians must fight and die on this hill of covenantal marriage as a legal reality throughout the United States, or we are abandoning our faith entirely? Well, yeah, one of the problems I have with that argument is I don't know who's actually doing that, okay? 
Who, who is actually saying I'm fighting and dying on covenantal marriage as the legal basis of marriage in the United States of America? Now, I see a lot of people fighting about not extending same-sex marriage to civil marriage. I, I see that. I, a lot of folks do that. What I'm not seeing is a political movement in the United States of America of any consequence at all to place covenant marriage or Christian marriage, or even something that's really sort of a, a, a ecumenical religious definition of marriage that matches, say, Muslim and Jewish and Christian tradition as marriage in the United States of America, right? In other words, there's no movement to revoke no fault divorce. Right. Now, some people might say, and they often do say, well, I don't like no fault divorce. But one of the next questions is, what have you done about it? And the answer is nothing. Like the, the answer is absolutely nothing. The answer is, well, maybe I've tweeted just when someone accuses me of hypocrisy. Well, I'm sorry, that's nothing. Okay, that is nothing. The thoughts in your head about not liking no-fault divorce do not equate with opposition to no-fault divorce. So as a, as a conservative movement, there is, now there have been some people who've done some interesting things like advocate for a concept, a legal concept called covenant marriage that you can voluntarily enter into instead of the normal civil marriage. So like when you go and you get a, a marriage certificate or seek a marriage certificate, what do you want? A no-fault normal civil marriage or do you want a covenant marriage where you've got, that's an interest, you know, those are interesting ideas, but they're, uh, they're, they're based on adult choice, right? You can choose the civil marriage or you can choose the covenant marriage. Right. That's again, a very small, very, very small part of the conservative movement. So a lot of these folks who are saying it's the end, it is the end unless we have covenant marriage really as the, the marriage in the United States of America, haven't been lifting one finger to do that for decades, okay? So w where are we? Well, where, are, where we are is the real, the real thrust of it is that this thing called civil marriage that it is dangerous to extend the definition of civil marriage to include same-sex marriage. And remember, civil marriage is not biblical marriage. Okay, it's not. Now, and people will say, well, you can't, there's a natural law argument here, right? They would say, under natural law, you can't call a, a marriage of, between two people is not marriage. I mean, two people of the same sex is not marriage. It's like calling a table a duck. Okay. And, and my, right. In other words, they, they put the, the conditions for divorce in a completely right. separate category from opposite sex marriage and same sex yeah. marriage, which is a fun, in their view, a fundamental redefinition of the covenant of marriage in a way that the details around divorce are not. Right. And my argument is the table's already been called a duck. Okay. So the, t for decades and decades in the United States of America, as civil marriage has evolved way beyond the bounds of biblical marriage, that uh, the table's already a duck, okay? And, and so let me put it more concretely, Sky. So we know, for example, that in the words, you know, of Christ's words himself, you know, a marriage, if, if, you, if you divorce absent scriptural grounds, you're committing adultery, right? That's adultery. So if you're, if you're applying this scriptural concept, there's millions of marriages in the United States of America that are adultery, okay? They're adultery. Including among Christians. Including among Christians. So, you know, as, as I was explaining to somebody who was saying, you know, once we're, I was talking about, I can't remember which one of the conservative thrice married politicians I was talking about, um, was, <laughs> look, you don't cure your adultery by marrying your mistress. You continue it. Okay? And so if you're talking about what is marriage biblically, there are millions more marriages than same-sex marriages that exist that biblically aren't marriages, they're adultery. Okay? So a lot of folks are now going to get kind of really mad at that <laughs> from the other side. They're going to say, what are you, what are you saying? Um, and so my issue is that what you're talking about here when you're talking about civil marriage is already something that is so divorced, uh, no pun intended, from covenant marriage that you're not, 
it's hard to say that I'm standing up for marriage when I'm saying a, 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 a change in civil marriage to encompass the relatively small percentage of people who are, want to enter into same-sex marriage is that that's the demolition of marriage. That's, in my, I just find, I find that unconvincing. Okay, so as I got caught up after my trip and reading through your pieces, Moeller's piece, the other criticism out there, uh, and I took a step back, my thought was, this is not about marriage. This is not about gay marriage. Mm -hmm. This is not about Christian covenantal marriage. No. This isn't even about conservatism or progressivism. As I read through this, my thought was, this is about pluralism and fundamentalism. Mm. This is about how do we as, as Christians share a country with a lot of people who believe differently than we do? You and I, I think, are in the camp of saying, we need to love our neighbors who believe differently and give them uh, a lot of accommodation and understanding and recognize that we want to persuade others of the truth of the gospel, the beauty of covenantal marriage, the reality of the Christian faith. but we're not going to condemn or discriminate against those who never are persuaded. Right. Versus those on the other side of, of this argument right now who are saying, no, we, we conservative Christians, theologically conservative Christians, must have control of the culture and of the government and of the law and impose upon everyone else a certain set of beliefs, whether they want them or not. That, that feels to me like the fundamental break here. and. I don't know if there's a way to resolve that. Like there are certain people who are saying, unless we have a, their understanding of what a Christian marriage is, be the law of the land, then all hope is lost. Whereas you're saying, no, I think we need to work on our own communities and our own marriages and our own, you know, faith tradition and, and, and shore this up rather than impose a standard, which doesn't even reach the biblical one on the entire country. Is that an unfair way of looking at this? Am I going too high altitude? <laughs> so I think. You know, as a broad framework, I think that that makes a lot of sense. But I would say less the fundamentalism piece as the really important thing, because a lot of people are not who are not fundamentalists disagree with me. You know, a lot of people who really abhor fundamentalism would would disagree with me. I would say it's the pluralism piece. OK, so that that's where I would say um, that's where you're really going to get. That's where the rubber really meets the road. What is your view of American pluralism? And, you know, I, I'm, I've been actually a part of some really interesting groups that have been talking about American pluralism. And one of the questions is, pluralism a means to an end? Or is pluralism an end in itself? In other words, um, pluralism is great only so long as it accomplishes certain kinds of objectives. So, for example... One benefit of pluralism is my religious freedom. And, and because of the religious freedom that I enjoy, I can persuade people to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that's why pluralism is good. And if pluralism starts enabling a bunch of bad outcomes, then pluralism is bad. So as or, long as pluralism only results in the outcomes I want, I'll play along. Or like on net, or on you know in the aggregate. Okay. Or, yeah, versus is creating a space where lots of people with lots of different worldviews can live and thrive together, actually also an end, not just a means, but an end, okay, of government. And I'm of a mean, I'm of both and. I think pluralism is a means to some really good things. So for example, um, when you're talking about Frederick Douglass and one of the most powerful uh, defenses of free speech ever mounted in the English language came from the abolitionist Frederick Douglass right before the Civil War, and he called free speech an indispensable element of pluralism, the great moral renovator of society and government. So without free speech, it's hard to morally renovate a culture. Right. So there is a, a definite means there. But then at the same time, creating a world in which um, pluralism as in the ability of lots of different people with lots of different worldviews to live together um, is by itself a valuable end. And, and I'm going to refer back to an earlier holy post, Sky, um, 
you guys had, you and Caitlin and Phil had this wonderful discussion recently about how often the Bible, when, when scripture is talking about condemning other countries aside from Israel, what are they being condemned for? Not welcoming the stranger, they're, 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 the way in which these societies treat the other, okay? And think about all of the ways in which we're encouraged to welcome, to treat, to have hospitality, to have love towards the other, right? Towards the outsider, to, towards our neighbor, towards the outsider, towards the stranger. Um, you know, that's where I'm thinking about this as a culture is a place of welcome for people even those people who dramatically disagree with us. And so I think of pluralism as not just a means to good, a good things, but also a good thing in and of itself. And that what pluralism means is going to morph and change in sort of actual real policy as cultural winds blow this way and that way. But I'm still committed to pluralism as both a means and an end. Amen. Um let me let me argue against that from okay go for it from al moeller himself he quotes you in his piece and we'll link to all these things in the in the show notes he quotes uh, one of your books where you say quote i recognize pluralism as a permanent fact of american life and seek to foster a political culture that protects the autonomy and dignity of competing american ideological and religious communities end quote and then he goes on to say this but what dare we ask are the allowable boundaries of respectable pluralism. And that's that to me is interesting. So Mueller doesn't want to come out and say categorically pluralism is bad and we need a monoculture in the United States, but he wants to know what are the boundaries on it. How far afield can someone go from what I assume to be his beliefs and views and still be acceptable in the United States? And for him at least, same-sex marriage is beyond the pale. It's beyond the boundary of what's allowed in a, in a healthy pluralistic society, whereas you and I would argue legal, civil, same-sex marriage is not beyond the boundary right. of what a healthy pluralistic society can tolerate. Um, what would you, how do you respond to him when he brings up this issue of what are the boundaries of pluralism? Right, and that, that's a... A really, uh, let me just begin by saying first, I respect people who disagree with me on this on around same sex marriage. <laughs> I, I am, I'm not somebody who's going to sit there and say these are horrible, awful people who disagree with me. Sure. Look, as I wrote, I wrote in my piece, I, I have been torn on this issue for years. Okay, so I, I get it, I get it. But this is what Al Mohler said. But again, I'll repeat it. But what dare we ask are the allowable boundaries of respectable pluralism? And answering this question, David French is particularly unclear. If he is clear, his view would undermine any stable public morality based on any objective moral truths. In other words, you don't believe in law. Sky, what the heck? <laughs> like, <laughs> what the heck? Heck. So we I should, mean, if if someone believes in murder, we need to allow murder in America because it's a sincerely held belief, even though you disagree. That seems to be what he's arguing. Right. Even if you're, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm much more libertarian leaning than a lot of my fellow Christians. Much, and I acknowledge that I'm mm -hmm. a, I'm a civil libertarian. I'm a libertarian leaning. But even if you take sort of an extreme libertarian position, one of the fundamental values of it is my rights end where yours begin. Exactly. Okay. So, and, and the argument I've heard for years, including some groups in Washington, D.C. that I was a part of before Obergefell was decided, was that the institution of same-sex marriage would, in you know, some way, impact, hurt, diminish the overall institution of marriage and therefore should be prohibited. Yeah, that was, a, that was an, a, an argument made that I was much less persuaded by um, because I thought heterosexuals had done an extremely good job all on their own. <laughs> right. But uh, Mueller's point is if you allow same-sex marriage, which in, again, putting words in his mouth a little bit, is, is part of the natural, a violation of natural law, you are undermining civilization, which would invariably be harmful to everybody to undermine civilization. Right. The, the problem is in the years since Massachusetts in 2004, the Supreme Court in 2015 
it's hard to point to specific evidence that the creation of a law recognizing same-sex marriage is destroying civilization. Right. It's really, it's really, and I don't even know truly how you'd go about doing, proving such a thing. I think there's an awful lot of evidence that instability and in, in a heterosexual relationships has had a lot, a huge negative effect. Right. By, com by comparison, the uh, gay relationships are a rounding error, right? They're, you know, even if you have a million people in, um, in gay marriages in the United States of America, there's 330 million people in the United States. So, and there's 10, 100 mil, 200, how many million people are impacted by straight marriages? Same, you right. know, same, uh, opposite sex, mar sex marriages. So, um, and I get the argument that says, okay, even if something only makes things 1% worse, we shouldn't make things 1% worse. I, I totally, I, I get that. I understand that. Um, but, you know, I think that the countervailing interest of these million plus Americans who've really formed their lives in reliance on a legal doctrine here, again, I'm going to go back to this idea of when is it just to rip out the legal foundation under which somebody has organized their lives, right? Um, but the, the problem with Moeller uh, is he did not limit his argument to just about marriage. He tried, he straw manned me. He straw manned the heck out of me. Because it was essentially saying, instead of arguing over the small sliver of marriages being incorporated within civil marriage, he tried to raise the specter of the total loss of any standards whatsoever. Right. Right. And that's where I really object to it. Like, can we please actually have an argument about what I actually argue rather than some slippery slope nonsense that's refuted only by hundreds of thousands of words I've written throughout my entire life and very clear legal and philosophical principles that says that, wait a minute, acknowledging pluralism in this context in no way means that there are now no standards governing, uh, you know, American, the American rule of law. So one of the questions I have, if, if I were to talk to someone like holding a position like, like Mueller's is, uh, or Mueller's, I said Mueller, I'm so used to those <laughs> I names. I know, the Mueller the report. <laughs> um, it, I'm trying to understand how his argument couldn't be used to likewise shut down non-Christian religious expression in the United States. In other words, the fact that we have a country, a pluralistic religious culture, that allows for mosques and Hindu temples and uh, synagogues and other religious communities to form and publicly organize— that is a departure from Christian faith, and it allows a free market of ideas where people may be persuaded away from Christianity. By one, why why is that an acceptable form of pluralism when, in his theology, that puts people's mortal souls at risk? That wouldn't, wouldn't seems... he argue for a system that only allows Orthodox, in his view, Christian churches to be publicly recognized by the state? See, this guy, that's. You raise a really good point, and this is something that I've asked a number of people, and that is, okay, wait a minute. Is the definition of marriage more important or less important than the doctrine of the personhood of Jesus Christ? Exactly. Right? One has eternal, eternal um, implications, right? And But we, because because of the arrangements we, because of the understandings and accommodations we realized we had to reach after the wars of religion, for example, that we had, we had to learn to give accommodation and protection to people who have fundamentally different, different beliefs about eternal matters. Okay. It, you know, the difference between say Judaism and Islam and Buddhism and Christianity is the, the differences are immense, but you will find very few people who say, well, we can't have a republic anymore if Jews and Muslims and Christians and Buddhists can all, you know, live together, work side by side, etc. One of the points that I've been making is if we have successfully incorporated a nation and created a nation in which people, and this is a long, painful process, by the way, it didn't happen overnight, but if we've been able to create a nation in which people who disagree over eternal matters fundamental eternal matters can now live together, work together, 
enjoy the same degree of religious liberty to advocate for different eternal points of view? Why is it a fundamental degradation of the American Republic when you're talking about matters that are more temporal than eternal? And I think that's a really important perspective and frame to put around this is this miracle that we have, historically speaking, of the religious liberty regime that we have in this country, and it is historically speaking, miraculous. It is a living demonstration that on the most important matters, people can live together, thrive together, protect each other's liberty without compromising their underlying moral convictions. That's a wonderful thing. That's, that's why I talk about pluralism as an end is a valuable, wonderful thing. And so I do not think that something of more temporal nature, civil marriage, again, we're talking civil marriage, is something that can threaten the United States when eternal differences do not. I, I think that's a pretty good place to wrap this up. And uh, again, why I don't think this is ultimately about marriage. It's about our understanding of pluralism and what mm -hmm. we as Christians should advocate for in a country with a lot of people that believe live differently than we do. Can we be advocates for our neighbor who disagrees with us, or do we fundamentally have to fight for a society in which we have ultimate control of definition of everything? And that fault line is getting deeper and deeper and deeper in Christian communities, and I think that's going to be what ends up separating one type of Christian from another is what do we believe about the people we share this land with who disagree with us? And I, I have very strong views on that, like you do, which is part of the reason I love having yep. you on this show. Um, I don't think there's any option. There's only one way forward. And uh, oh, I, yeah, I just we'll link to all these articles in the show notes. Thank you guys all for listening, David. Thank you for uh, graciously fielding all the criticism and and vitriol and the pile on over the last couple of days. Uh, I'm sure it won't be the last time that you face that, but uh, <laughs> your grace in the midst of it is is admirable, and we appreciate it very much. Well, thanks so much, Sky. And I got to say, this is the most impressive jet-lagged interview I've ever participated in in my life. So this is fantastic. Well, thankfully, uh, I was only coming from Europe and not India. Otherwise, this would not have <laughs> happened. That's for sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, we will catch up again before the end of the year, hopefully, and do another one of these. And I'm sure we'll have plenty to talk about. Thanks, David. Thanks, Guy. French Friday is a production of Holy Post Media, featuring David French and me, Sky Jatani. Production by Julie Betcher. Editing by Jason Rugg. Music and theme song by Phil Vischer. This show is made possible by Holy Post patrons. To find out how you can become a Holy Post patron and to find more common good Christian content, go to holypost.com.